Good evening. On behalf of the Indiana University College of Arts and Sciences, thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Vanessa Klo, and I serve as the college's director of alumni relations. Our Food for Thought live streaming series serves as an opportunity for alumni and friends to hear from faculty experts, explore topics of interest, and stay connected with IU and the College of Arts and Sciences, regardless of your location. At this time, I'm delighted to introduce tonight's featured presenter, professor, and chair of geography, Justin Maxwell. Professor Maxwell is a climatologist whose research bridges climate science and forest ecology, he uses tree rings to examine climate conditions in the past to put current climate conditions into a historic context. He also examines how climate extremes, particularly drought, have impacted our forests to better understand how they will respond to a future with more frequent and intense droughts. Following his presentation, Professor Maxwell will be joined by Dr. Macarena Ferri for the audience Q&A session. A dendro ecologist, Dr. Ferri uses dendrochronology, wood anatomy, and ecophysiology to understand the process underlying tree mortality. As a postdoctoral researcher in Professor Maxwell's lab, she is currently studying the decline of pecan trees in the upper Mississippi River to project forest growth in Indiana forests. You can submit your questions at any point during this evening's discussion simply click on the Q&A tab located in your webinar toolbar. Hover your mouse over your screen and your toolbar should appear. Closed captioning is also available. Now it is my pleasure to welcome Professor Maxwell for his presentation. Thank you. Thank you all for uh, taking the time to come see what I've been working on. I'm excited to, to talk to you all today or tonight, I should say, about um, the, the what trees can tell us. So. Um, as you can see from my talk title here, um, you know, and then from the introduction, I think a lot about trees, uh, particularly the, their growth ring. So the first thing that I would like to cover is, is what is a tree ring? Okay, there we go. And so um, tree rings are actually annual growth rings. And so trees can produce those every year um, most in most locations. And I mean, most, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm actually talking more about mid-latitude locations, like where we live here in Indiana but also farther north in the boreal forest around the Arctic. Uh, and that's true for the Southern Hemisphere as well. But in the middle of our planet, the tropics, it gets a little bit a little bit more murky. Um, because the tropics are so warm, trees sometimes don't stop growing throughout the entire year. So they actually don't produce a ring. Uh, however, in certain locations in the tropics, it can be a, a really distinct wet or dry season, and they'll produce a ring. And in some crazy locations, trees can produce more than one ring in a year. Uh, and so I've done some work in the tropics. It's very difficult work. It's definitely one of the more sort of frontiers of, of types of works of the type of work that I do. Uh, but today's talk is going to be focused on the mid-latitude locations, in particular, uh, the United States. Um, and so there's a lot of different things you can do with dendrochronology. That's the fancy word for looking at tree rings to study uh, either climate or whatever it may be. Um, you know, dendroarchaeology, people use tree rings to help date historical constructions. Um, of course, dendroclimatology, uh, you can use it to reconstruct climate, which I'll be talking about today. Dendroecology, you can also use the tree rings as sort of an ecological metric of how things are, are doing. I'm also going to talk about the that today. So these are two I'm going to focus on, is dendroclimatology and ecology. But you can see here a long list of a lot of things people can do with tree rings. And that's mainly because trees can record anything, anything they experience. Um, they pretty much record somewhere, usually in their wood. And so uh, there's a lot of great and smart people out there who, who use this to, to think about how things have changed and what, what trees are responding to. So when I talk about tree rings, I figured this would be the easiest way to kind of describe it here. So this is, this is our tree. You can see the bark on the outsides here, and we've sort of broken it up. Tree rings are the, you can see them in a couple of different ways, but I'm talking about this cross-sectional view. So you want to think about, the, you know, in this case, if you were to cut a tree down, if you look directly down the stump, that's what I'm talking about here with this cross-sectional view. Um, you can see the tree rings with the center of the tree and then goes out to the center. Um, you may, you know, for those of you who maybe are more familiar with some different various types of wood, this radial view is often what you'll see on, on desk or hardwood floors. Uh, this um, tangential plane is 
you'll see that on a door often, sometimes a wooden door. And so you might know, recognize some of these patterns, uh, but they're all different parts of the tree. But today we're solely focused on this cross-sectional view. So before, I'm, I'm sure a lot of you are sitting there thinking now like, oh my God, this guy goes around and finds really old trees and cuts them all down. Um, no, I, I don't do that. Uh, I feel terrible if I did that. Uh, I do get to go around and find really old trees. I really love my job. Um, I've been to a lot of really amazing places. Cool thing about finding old trees is that you usually find them in locations that are hard to get to. Um, not always, uh, but sometimes, most of the time. And so it's a lot of fun to think of, you know, really get, get to, you know, get out in the wilderness and do some fun things. So we use this instrument called an increment bore. This is me uh, a few years ago. And I'm used, so it's a handheld drill. I'm drilling into an oak right now. And so what we basically do is put a five millimeter hole into the tree. So it's not a very big hole. Um, and we get this pencil size core out of the tree that looks something like this. And so this is how we can look at the rings uh, without doing damage to the tree. Um, trees can either fill, a, fill that hole up with sap if it's a conifer. If it's a hardwood, it actually compartmentalizes the damage and shuts access off to the xylem and heals in that regard. So in both in both cases, uh, trees have mechanisms for healing uh, from this small type of wound. Um, you know, they lose branches, they get struck by lightning, they survive all kinds of crazy things. Um, and so this is a great way for us to be able to, to, to one, see how old trees are, but two, use that information that they uh, they record without without doing the tree damage. So once we have these different samples, we uh, we mount them on these wooden mounts with just regular old Elmer's glue, and we mount the you know either can tape them or we can clip them, we can tie you know whatever you need to do to basically secure them in the mount until the glue dries, and then we we sand them with sandpaper. And really, for anybody who's done any sort of woodworking, it's not really sanding what we're doing here. It's it's more polishing. We start out at 120 grit and uh, we, we end somewhere between 600 and 2000 grit sandpaper. So it's a really fine polish on these samples so we can look at them under the microscope at some of these rings. Um, and so uh, the main thing we want to do now is cross date. And so let me walk you through what this means. So we have our samples, we sand them, we can see those rings. So in this figure here, you're seeing maybe this cross section is coming from this stump, this, uh, this sample is coming sorry, from this stump, uh, this section in the middle is coming from another piece of wood, and this section is from another piece of wood. Well, usually when we go out and, and, and collect trees, we're going to collect somewhere anywhere from 10 to maybe 50 trees uh, for a given species. And we do this to so we can ensure we're actually dating the trees, the, you know, the, the samples correctly. Um, this is called cross-dating. So you can actually measure the widths. You get a number, and we do a very simple correlation analysis from that sample from this one sample with every other sample we've taken uh, that we that we we sampled that uh, during that expedition. And so this is sort of an illustration, illustrative example here. And what you find is that because of all the trees are responding to climate, they do show the same pattern of wide and small rings. So we're looking for these really big rings and these really small rings. Uh, like here's a good example, um, uh, 1847. And uh, that allows us to be confident in that we're actually dating the trees correctly. And this is important because if we're doing a paleoclimate reconstruction and we want to talk about a drought that happened in 1436, for example, we want to make sure that it actually did occur in 1436 and not, you know, 1438 or something like that. Probably even more importantly, if we want to talk about droughts impacts on forest and growth, uh, you know, we had to be got to be sure we're talking about the right year of growth. You know, our most recent drought was 2012. So if we want to look at the impacts of growth on the 2012, uh, of the 2012 drought, we do want to make sure that it's not 2013 that we're accidentally looking at for growth or, or 2011. And so this cross-dating cross procedure helps us make sure uh, that our trees are accurately dated and we can actually talk about um, uh, the correct things when it comes to either paleoclimate or forest ecology. Okay, so that's why cross-dating matters. Um, so let's talk a little bit about trees. Uh, we're going to do a little bit, I'm going to give two kind of various talks today, one about paleoclimate, one about ecology. So you need to know a little bit about, about sort of broadly about trees. There are two broad groups. Uh, the first group I want to talk about are genosperms. They're also known as conifers. So these are needle-based trees, any pine, fir, larch, bald cypress, anything that has needles. Uh, they're generally generally considered evergreen. However, there are actually a number of conifer coniferous trees that lose their needles, they're deciduous. Uh, the bald cypress do, we have some here on campus uh, that lose their needles every winter. Uh, larch are, are one of those as well. 
But what all gen genosperms have in common is their wood anatomy. And so when I talk about a growth ring, I'm actually talking about a couple of different things depending on what species we're talking about. And this is gonna be really important for a little bit later. Um, all conifers grow in this way. So this would be the beginning of the growth year where my mouse is located right here. And then the end is this darker band. Uh, so this is one, one growth year across the screen. And so what you see as the beginning of the growth year, the tree produces pretty large cells with very thin cell walls. As you continue throughout the growth, growth, growth year, those cells are gonna gradually get smaller and the cell walls get thicker. Why does this, this matter? Because it creates a very distinct light and dark band for each growth year. And this lighter band is for the earlier season and we call that early wood. And this darker band is the later season, we call that late wood. So you can do some seasonal analyses and you'll see that people have gotten really clever. Uh, and I'll give an example of something that I've done uh, with this seasonal wood. And so um, that's how conifers work for the most part. And so uh, let's talk about our angiosperms. Uh, these are listed as deciduous. Angiosperms are broadleaf or hardwood. So think about your oaks, your maples, your tulip poplars, or tulip trees, uh, you know, all those different varieties that produce all those beautiful colors in the fall. Um, they're not all deciduous though, even though this, this slide says that. Uh, there are some evergreen uh, broadleafs here, even in the mid latitudes, but particularly in the tropics as well. But angiosperms can be broken up into two various groups for our purposes, uh, and that's based on their wood anatomy, ring porous and diffuse porous. So ring porous wood is illustrated really well by pretty much any type of oak. And so they start the growing season off with these really large vessels. Um, and these help transport water up the tree to allow them to leaf out in the spring. And then as the tree keeps growing, it mostly is using wood fiber at that point. So one growth ring is from these big circles to the right, uh, to the next group. So this would be one ring here. So we can classify this as early wood, these big vessels, and this is late wood. They still have vessels within this late wood. They're just much smaller. Uh, so they're still producing water throughout the growing season, um, but it's mostly dominated by much smaller vessels and, and wood fibers. The fuse porous trees scatter their, uh, their vessels throughout the growing season. So here's three examples here. And then you can see what, I, what we usually look at under the microscope. So here's our oak, this is our ring porous. And we take a look here, I can add some illustrative backgrounds here. So here's our oak, um, and this is a sugar maple. You can see the ring boundaries actually actually can be pretty difficult to see uh, due to, due to the, the lack of clustering of vessels. We have an American beech here and a tulip poplar tulip tree. Um, and this, this is what they look like. And so, you know, sort of a zoomed in, this is a, a, another type of maple. Um, this was from Europe, but we can see there's no clustering. The vessels are kind of scattered equally throughout the growth year, making the ring boundary pretty difficult to distinguish. Um, and these choices in wood anatomy, they're not really choices, but these are evolutionary responses to competition and climate. And there's, there's pros and cons to these things. And uh, I have a lot of fun studying, studying those, uh, those aspects and why we have different types of wood anatomy. Okay, so I feel like we're all on a good spot here. We kind of got a good basis. We all kind of know what a tree ring is, kind of have a broad introduction to trees. So let me first talk to you about a, pay, uh, a project we worked on, um, and it was published in the Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences, which is a pretty decent journal, um, and that was in 2021, so it's a pretty recent recent uh, paper that I led. Um, and we looked at um, tropical cyclone precipitation. Now, that's a pretty big mouthful. Tropical cyclone is a fancy word for a hurricane. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, there's a lot of different names for hurricanes throughout the globe, depending on what basin you're in. And so the standard sort of word is tropical cyclone uh, and then precipitation. So I, to save myself some, some tongue twisting, uh, I'll probably refer to them as TCP. And when I say that, it means tropical cyclone precipitation. So the idea was, can we use tree rings to look at changes in hurricane rainfall or tropical cyclone precipitation over time? Uh, we all know, I'm sure every one of you have seen the damage hurricanes can cause. Uh, we see those, those devastating, like something, a picture like this, or whether it be storm surge or high winds, they can, they can wreak havoc along coastal communities. Um, however, the rainfall they produce is a little bit less understood, or at least not well, it's not as much on the media. And so this is the example of Hurricane Florence in 2018. It dumped over 30 inches of rainfall in Wilmington, North Carolina. But what I really want to, the real interesting thing about, about rain and flooding from tropical cyclones 
is it's a much broader area. The, the storm surge is a very narrow region along the coast. High winds can definitely cause damage farther inland, but not, not compared to rainfall. So this map here is showing us what's called a recurrence interval. And so everything in white means that this event, this Hurricane Florence, produced a one in 1,000 year event, meaning that just from a probability standpoint, you would only expect to get this kind of rainfall once in 1,000 years. So it's a pretty rare event, but think about this broad area that, is, that it covers. Um, when you get that much rainfall over such a broad area, it creates a lot of issues, a lot of displacement. It's actually the leading cause of death for tropical cyclones is inland flooding, not storm surge, not wind speed, just a bunch of rain. Um, and so uh, it's a really important aspect of studying and, and to consider. Okay, so what do we do? So this is an interesting study because the key for paleoclimate work is to find really old trees. So we had to find really old trees that were kind of close to the coast, but not too close, right? Because if it was too close, they would probably get clobbered by really high winds or washed away by big storm surges. And so we had, had to find some, you know, some something in the middle. So one species that came to mind that might be really sensitive was a tree called a longleaf pine. The problem with longleaf pine, though, is they're really beautiful. Their wood is gorgeous. And you'll see a couple examples here in a bit. So they've been logged like crazy. They were also, there was very resinous. They're one of the most resinous species on the planet, which means that they produce a lot of sap. So they were used for turpentining uh, in naval stores pretty much all through the 1800s, starting in the late 1700s, all the way up until pretty much the early 1900s. So finding undisturbed, really old longleaf pine is really challenging. So there's this weird environment along coastal north, all basically from like Georgia up through Virginia, where they had these sort of ridges, these really sandy ridges um, that are they're called bay ridges. And so they're surrounded by these areas that used to be filled with water that are pretty much have dried up for the most part, but they're very still very swampy. Um, and so they have, you know, this, this looks like it'd be really easy to walk through. It is not. It's some of the hardest traversing I've ever done. You had to have a machete to hike your way through, you hack your way through the whole entire time. So why this matters is we were able to find enough of these ridges, whoopsie, sorry, I didn't mean to click, enough of these ridges um, to find old trees that haven't been touched because there are just not very many of them. And if you're going to out and try, go out and try to log them or, or turpentine them, it was really hard to get to and it wasn't worth the effort. And so they remained in, in on the landscape. Um, and so really old in this case was, you know, 400 year old trees we were able to find. Um, and so we're really happy with that. So this is sort of the, the trees we sampled. And the reason why we thought this might work for recording hurricane rainfall is because this is sort of our surface. You can kind of see it here, sort of a concave surface on these ridges. And longleaf pine have tap roots like all trees do. So they can access groundwater pretty much anytime unless it's very, very dry. But they have crazy amounts of lateral roots, uh, very extensive. And so the idea was if you get enough rainfall, like a whole bunch from like a, like a hurricane uh, that brings up the water table, these lateral roots now are, have access to the groundwater. And so they'll grow more. And so it's kind of counterintuitive. We purposely selected sites that would be positively influenced by hurricanes rather than negatively. Because if the tree got knocked over and died, and that happened 100 years ago, we're probably not going to find it. Um, it's probably going to have decomposed or, or burnt, been burnt by a fire or something like that. Um, so we're looking for trees that were still living. And so a positive impact would be the way we want to go. And so we use those late wood, the late wood imaging, the, the, the late wood part of the growth to reconstruct climate. So let me walk you through this graph. It's a really common graph that we have in uh, paleo climate reconstructions. So you need to do some sort of reconstruction. You first need some sort of instrumental recording of that data, whether it be temperature, maybe it's a, a soy moisture metric or something. In this case, it's hurricane rainfall. And that's our black line. So this black line represents what we actually recorded at weather stations from the various years of hurricane rainfall in our in our in our along the along the east coast. Um, and you can kind of see that. For now, let's ignore this pink line. I'll come back to that in a second. Let's just focus on the blue line. So the idea, you know, the best case scenario would be that this blue line matches the black line perfectly, and we have an amazing, you know, really high variance explained as the metric we use, and we can be really excited about it. And if you look in this portion of it, it is really solid. We do see a lot of correspondence between the blue and that black line. In other areas, maybe not so much. We do have some over and underestimations here. Um, but overall, this is a decent, a decent correspondence because trees are responding to other things as well. In this case, it had been fire frequency, insect outbreaks, competition, 
<clears throat> so we know we're never, it's not, and they're, you know, they're responding to rainfall through other parts of the season. Um, you know, so we know wind damage potentially. So we know it's not going to be a perfect relationship here. Um, but so assuming this relationship is statistically significant and it, it shows enough robust power that you can use it, you can then use tree rings back in time to estimate what that climate variable was like. And so maybe it's temperature, maybe it's drought, but in this case, it's hurricane rainfall. And so this is what our reconstruction looks like. And so we have our black line here, and this is sort of our model. So we calibrated our model in this period, and then we use that relationship to then predict this stuff back in time. Yeah, you can see our blue line here. So let's talk about this pink line. Um, so tree rings are not very good at representing super extreme conditions. Uh, they tend to underestimate how dry things are. They, be a little, they appear to be a little wetter uh, than what actually happened. They also tend to underestimate how wet things are. And so we can bias correct those uh, to add a little bit more variance into the into this uh, reconstruction to better match the record. So we have our reconstruction. The first thing that jumped out to me were all these really high values here in the more recent portion. There's only two years that maybe rivaled it. This sort of gray brown color is our uncertainty. Uh, you know, like I said, we did not. It's not a perfect model. Uh, there is some uncertainty there. We can quantify that and estimate it. And so we have two years here back in the 1700s, early 1700s to mid 1700s, uh, that maybe match this most recent period of, of really high um, rainfall records. But it is a really substantial, a really uh, stark uh, reconstruction to see all these high values here in the more recent period. Normally tree ring records, a reconstruction is gonna say, hey, that 2012 drought was pretty bad, but according to the tree ring record, there's been way worse droughts. You should prepare for even worse, con worse conditions. More recently, we've been finding a lot of cases in which we're experiencing conditions that are kind of unprecedented, at least in the since the tree's been alive. In the last, I mean, in this case, it's, you know, a little over 300 years. Um, in some cases, maybe a thousand or two thousand years. So, but we're still this is becoming a more common story. So, to look at this a little bit more. I first want to look at trends. So, let this figure is going to seem the next couple of figures are a little tough, but I can I promise I can walk you through it here. And so, what I've done instead of a time series here, a little squiggly line. I've just put a dot for each year. And so now we have a dot for each year. And then I wanted to see if there was a trend. So normally if you wanted to do that, you would have taken the mean the, the, or the median, I guess, the 50th um, percentile here, which is this orange line, and it would show a decreasing trend in TCP. <clears throat> but when I looked at this, I was like, man, that's not really decreasing. We have a, a lot of big high events. We can look at different parts of distribution. We can look at the really wet end, the 0.99. We can look at the 0.95 parts. This is pretty wet. And what we see is there is increasing trends in these, in these wetter ends of the distribution, decreasing in the middle and pretty flat at the drier end. And so another way to look at this is just to simply plot out these slopes. So each of these lines have a slope. So we can do that. Uh, we, can, we can just put, this is the slope, the trend line. Uh, you know, this is the change of millimeters per year. Um, this is for the whole distribution. It's the whole quantile. Uh, so this is that 25 that we looked at. Here is the 0.5. So we kind of come back and that checks out as decreasing. So we get a negative trend line. And if you get above or below these, these red lines, this is when we're talking about statistical significance. So if you see something like this, you're like, okay, that could be a pretty impressive decrease. The uncertainty is this gray area. It still does overlap in this in the red zone. So maybe it's, an, maybe it's something to be concerned about, maybe not. But what really jumps out is the end of dis distribution here. It's quite, quite an increasing trend there. Um, and so I've, I've basically zoomed in from 0.75. So I just zoomed in this graph. Uh, so it's the same thing here, but just showing you every ring or every, uh, sorry, every every part of the quantile uh, or the distribution. And you can see this increasing trend. So what does that tell us? Basically it's saying that the years that we experienced the wettest amount of hurricanes in this region are getting wetter, which is really concerning because if you're talking about a really wet year, uh, now we're adding rain to that. So the wettest years in the early 1700s Let's say, I don't know, they were they were 10 inches. We're talking about an additional four to five inches of rainfall now if we had a similar event in this day and age. So why why would that be the case? Um, so there's a few different ways you can you can uh, why that would happen. So trees are recording the total amount of seasonal hurricane rainfall. They're not being they can't really separate it by storm. Some years is maybe it's one storm, other years it could have been three storms. So maybe over time we're just getting more storms that make landfall. So maybe that's why it's increasing. 
The other way it, you, you could have this is maybe the hurt, the storms are lasting a little bit longer. They're they're stalling out. They're hanging out in the area. And so we did a number of tests. Um, the numbers of storms didn't really change through time. And we, we really did this pretty exhaustively. And the only thing that really stuck out was this duration metric. The storms are in the area longer. They're more likely to meander. And this, this goes really well with how we understand the climate system in, in a warming world. Uh, the jet stream is what controls a lot of how things move. Um, and it is become, in, in certain parts, it's going to stall out a little bit more. And when it does that, these storms get stuck in one region. So Hurricane Florence in 2018 was a great example. Hurricane Harvey is another great example off of Houston, Texas. And that's probably the most infamous example of this happening. Um, and so we're this is more likely to happen. We're likely to see these really big years. Now, some years we might not get anything. So it's not necessarily 100% like, oh, we're just always going to get more rainfall from these hurricanes. But it is saying the most extreme possible events are going to be wetter now than they were in the past. And that's likely due to the to climate change in a, in a warmer planet. And so that's the take home from a paleoclimate example. I want to shift gears here and talk about um, dendroecology. I was trained as a climate scientist uh, initially. And so most of my work has been in paleoclimate. But over the last maybe six or seven years, I've started becoming an ecologist. I started thinking about trees as a biological organism and what biases they may introduce into something like a reconstruction. And that got me thinking about, I was all of a sudden starting to think like an ecologist. And so I tell people I was a pretend ecologist for a while. I had a great opportunity. I was able to go on a sabbatical um, and I got a fellowship to work at Harvard uh, with a bunch of forest ecologists. And I learned a ton and I've been doing some great work and I'm happy to, this is work that's actually ongoing here. Um, I just got some feedback from some of my collaborators. And so I'm hoping to submit this paper soon over the next uh, couple months actually. And so um, this is sort of the work that's I've been working on for several years. And so, okay. This is the, now we're talking about hardwoods. So we're talking about angiosperms and hardwoods. And this, these, this Google map here is a representation of all the sites I've been collecting. And you can see a big clustering here around Bloomington. Some of this has definitely been done advantageously. I can dip out for a weekend. And I started this when I was hired here in Bloomington. So this, this project is near and dear to me. Um, and so uh, this is, this has worked literally from 2012 on. Um, and so this is this has been a long a long time coming. <clears throat> but at each one of these sites, I have multiple species that we can compare. And so I'm going to jump right into this here. And so we did the same sort of sampling procedure, except for we targeted uh, five really common species. So this is the tulip tree or tulip poplar. Uh, this is a sugar maple. This is a shagbark hickory. This is a white oak, and this is a red oak. So that's what these these uh, acronyms are for. And they're organized in this way because sugar, these, these two are uh, diffuse porous trees. They have their vessels scattered throughout the growth year. They're also quite conservative uh, when, when, it, when drought comes. They tend to, to shut down photosynthesis, and which it has an impact on growth. They protect themselves. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, red oak and, and white oak are sort of the rock stars. They basically don't care if it, when it's dry. They're just going to grow anyways. Uh, and that's pretty cool. That's a really cool strategic advantage. Uh, however, it can come at the risk of death. So it's quite it's quite the, the risky strategy. So we have this continuum here of different strategies. So that's our x-axis. Our y-axis is I was trying to quantify a way of like what is the impact of drought. So what this represents is the percentage of decrease that you get in growth during a drought year compared to any other year. Um, and so if it's not a drought, you know, yeah, I took the average of that. Just what is the percentage decrease in growth during drought? And what we see is that these uh, diffuse poor species, these more conservative species, do have a bigger decrease in growth uh, than than the than the more aggressive species. And this is done. Uh, you can so this 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 means that it was one standard deviation below the mean. So this is a, a metric for soy moisture, and I'm trying to define what a drought is. So this would be an abnormally dry period, but not crazy, not crazy dry, just kind of dry. These letters represent a way of grouping it. This is a statistical analysis we can do. It's pretty simple. It's just an ANOVA. It's just saying, are the means of these different groups different from one another? And so the tulip poplar and sugar maple, they're the same. They both have an A, uh, but tulip poplar is different than these three species. Uh, while sugar maple overlaps with these two, it does not overlap with the red oak. So we got some species differences here um, to some extent. Um, if you increase the severity of that drought to one and a half standard deviations or even two standard deviations, that you do see a, de a bigger decrease in growth. The percentages pretty much for all the species uh, 
increase. So we have a we have a more of a growth decrease. It's kind of a weird thing to say. So they're they're impacted even more by growth. Um, and we can see that those species differences converge there uh, to some extent. So when it gets super dry, all trees care. And and while it does, they have some species differences. Uh, they all are definitely substantially decreasing their growth. Um, if we look at the wet period, if you've ever wondered to yourself, what is the opposite word of a drought? That's a pluvial. Um, you can see that they do lead to increases in growth, no matter, you know, even with really, really wet periods, but they don't, they don't really match the same percentage of drought. So drought has a much bigger impact on tree growth uh, than the wet periods. And we don't see much species differences here in the wet periods. So we can focus here on the droughts. The droughts are the, are the one things I really want to, I want to focus on. And so another way to look at this is just to graph out all of the, all the growth through time. So we have our, our drought metric here. This is dry. This is wet. And then we have growth. So we have more growth up high, low growth down below. And we can see for the tulip poplar, we have a pretty decent, our slope is 0.94. So a pretty decent increase in growth through the through, through uh, you know, through the distribution of, of, uh, of soy moisture, when something like red maple is a pretty flat growth line, it doesn't it doesn't quite care as much. It does grow a bit more when it's wet, and it grows a little bit less when it's dry, but it doesn't change all that much. And so that kind of goes into into line with the other stuff we're talking about. So what I think is happening here is, remember I talked about that aggressive and conservative strategy. There's fancy words for those. And isohydric is the aggressive strategy. Isohydric is the conservative strategy. So this is when everything's happy. We, everything's well watered. We got growth growing. We got we got photosynthesis happening. Everything's everything you know everything's doing what we normally would do. Uh, but these species that are that are anisohydric have much deeper roots. And so when drought hits, uh, there is a decrease in growth for sure. Um, but there's pretty deep roots, so they can still access water. For these more shallow root species, that decrease in growth is much more substantial uh, because they can't access water and they don't want to die. So they have to be really conservative and kind of shut down photosynthesis and everything. And so we have a bigger impact on growth uh, for these species. So uh, this matters for two reasons. One, uh, climate is changing. And so uh, this is an example of the best case scenario for the future. This would be if we don't really put, put more a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere, uh, so the blue distribution is our current from 1901 to present. This is currently what we've experienced. And this red distribution here would be uh, what would be predicted. So we can see our mean and shift. But here's our negative one. You can see the frequency in which negative one events occur quite a bit more, uh, even one and a half and even two increase as well. If we take the worst case scenario, which is, you know, neither of these are terribly likely. We're probably going to be in somewhere in the middle of these two things. Uh, but if we take our worst case scenario, uh, you can see this is substantially different. I mean, the mean shifts a whole standard deviation. Uh, that's pretty dramatic. And you can see our big increases, particularly in the really extreme droughts. This would, be, this would be terrible. So we have more droughts that are coming. We also have a, have a system uh, in our forests where we have a demographic shift. And so traditionally, these forests were dominated by oaks and hickories. And due to fire suppression and, and to some extent, a wetter climate that we've been experiencing recently, we have much more maple and tulip poplar and beech in our forest systems. So we have a changing climate. We also have a changing forest. And a changing forest is going to species that are more vulnerable to dry conditions. And to the best of our knowledge, dry conditions are going to be returning here soon. Um, and so what does that mean? So I kind of did some sort of hypothetical of various different types of forests where there'd be oak hickory dominated, more of a mix, more of a mazic where we have maple and tulip poplar mixed together or just maple. And this is our cumulative drought effect. So this would be for mild droughts because they happen so frequently, you get a pretty big cumulative effect here. But in all cases, even the moderate and extreme, you do see that mazic and maple are, are a bit lower than, than the oak hickory or the mixed. Um, and so and I, I showed the pluvials, but um, there's not a lot to really report there, except for they just don't, they don't match with the droughts. The droughts are having much bigger impact. And so if we look about the future, um, so these are our observed, it's the same figure, I just squished them together. These are for our various different drought metrics. We can see what would happen for the various scenario. This is our most conservative one, the one that we hope to happen. This would be the worst case scenario. Um, and you can see that in all cases, that mazic, that mazic uh, forest is, is more impacted. So um, it is really concerning. We basically have a forest that might be more concert, more sensitive to drought and more drought predicted to happen. And so when we're thinking about trees' ability to bring suck up CO2 and help us, uh, drought's going to have an even more important role because every time a drought hits, trees grow less, 
therefore take up less CO2. But now we're having species that grow even less than, than maybe what used to be in the forest. And so that's also a pretty big concern. So the overall conclusions for this talk are listed here. Uh, but basically, it's just that future climate, along with changes in the, in the species makeup of the forest, uh, to 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 uh, to drought is changing the eastern U.S. and it pretty much is leading us to an area where we're going to be in a weird position where we might have really sensitive forest and more drought returning too. And so it's something for us to consider, and particularly forest managers. Okay, so that's a good example of forest ecology. Um, I am done, and I'm happy to answer all your questions. But before we get to that point, I do want to thank. There's a whole army of people who have helped me in the field. Uh, uh, and then these people, a lot of these people are now PhD. They had gotten their doctorates. They started off here as sometimes undergraduates. And so it's been really, really fun to watch all these people work through their careers. Uh, also would like to acknowledge a lot of the funding that I've gotten from NSF, USDA, even the fellowship from Harvard Forest, and of course, even internal programs from here at IU uh, as well. And so thank you very much. And I'm happy to answer uh, any questions. You mentioned before that you usually look for very old trees. How can you recognize a very old tree before coring it? That's an excellent question, actually. It's a bit of an art. Um, I remember there's a, there's a guy named Neil Peterson that I, I work with a lot. And I remember walking around the forest with him, and he was talking about, oh, that tree's old. And I was like, is it? And then we would core it, and it was. And I was like, oh, my God, this guy is like a tree whisperer. Um, so there's a few things you can look for. Um, for here in Indiana, if it's a big tree out in the middle of a field, probably not that old. Um, there's a few exceptions to that rule, but generally speaking, that tree is very happy, doesn't have a lot of competition. Um, so it's gonna produce pretty big growth rings um, over time. So that's one key. If you're in a forest and you see a really a really large tree and it's really straight potentially, or maybe it's, it's gnarly, but it doesn't have any high branch, it doesn't have any lower branches. The first branches you get to are pretty high up on the, on the stem. That's a really good sign. Um, you know, if it is gnarly, that indicates that maybe it had, had to grow really like, th you know, in a closed canopy forest really slowly. And so we're looking for that type of stuff. If the branches are really big and they're like hanging down, that's a really good sign. If you're working in a conifer forest, the trees can actually spiral. The bark will look spirally. The tip, the, the very tips are usually dead and they're, you know, they're kind of dying. Um, they usually have a couple of live branches. And so there's, there's a few, there's actually a whole entire article on, on, <laughs> on like what, what it is. But with that said, I'm surprised constantly. I've been doing this, I realized for almost 20 years now, and I'll go out into a forest and I still get surprised. Some tree is going to be like, oh my gosh, I didn't expect it to be that old. And some tree I'm really excited about is not quite as old as I thought it was going to be. Um, so those morphological keys can be helpful, but it's certainly, it's definitely not perfect uh, for sure. Oh, thanks a lot. So let's move to the next question. Um, around Bloomington and in Indiana in general, there are a lot of beautiful places for hiking. Mm -hmm. um, could you tell us what would be uh, the best place for hiking if you're looking for a very old forest? Yeah, actually, I'm really excited to tell you. But okay, yeah. So there's a forest called uh, Donaldson Woods. It's in Spring Mill State Park. It's about, I don't know, 30 to 45 minutes south of here, in, south of Bloomington. Um, I, I've i been to almost every old growth forest in the state. I think there's one that I just found that I haven't been to. And this is the only one that I think is truly virgin. What I mean by that word is that when Europeans sort of colonize the U.S., they have not cut this forest. It rivals things I've seen in the, in the Smoky National Park. It is a very small tract of land, um, and it's not terribly well advertised, but if you go into Spring Mill State Park and you go to the parking lot, there's signs for Donaldson Woods. Uh, but there's also, it's in the same parking lot where uh, the eyeless fish were discovered. So this is a pretty cool area. So we already have this area being really famous for, um, you know, finding the, the fish in the caves. Uh, for some, some, some people may know of that. Uh, but in that same parking lot, you can walk through this forest and they have gigantic white oak and tulip trees. Uh, it, it's just jaw dropping. I mean, I, went, I, I go there frequently. Um, Love it. So that would be my top pick. Um, Pioneer Mothers is pretty pretty nice as well. It, it has a lot of really big trees. Uh, that's kind of where the first site I visited when I got the job here. Uh, Meltzer Woods is a place near Shelbyville, uh, Indiana. And it actually has the oldest tree I found in the state. It's a shagbark hickory and it goes to uh, 1662. So those would be the top three uh, of what I visited. And they're all in Southern Indiana, which is not terribly surprising. Interesting. 
I'm taking notes. <laughs> uh, okay, so one question um, in relation to the last project that you presented, what relationship do you see between the sensitive trees, the MASIC and drought? Will we lose MASIC and how will this affect how different species work together? Yeah, so I think I understand the question. So basically, those 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 mazic species were the sugar maple and tulip poplars, and they had really big drought effects. So meaning that when the drought occurred, they had a substantial decrease in growth, like the percentage of growth would dramatically decrease. And so when they're together, and your forest is dominated by those types of species, when a drought occurs, it has a big impact on growth. And the reason why we care about that is because trees suck up CO2. But when it's a drought, they don't, they can't, they don't suck up CO2 as much. And we're finding that it depends on what species are in the forest, how good they are at doing that. And oak and the hickory uh, during droughts, they still grow. They're still going to, you know, sequester carbon. They're going to keep doing their thing. Um, and if we're transitioning from an oak hickory forest that's dominated by those sort of trees that don't necessarily care about drought, and we transition to species that do care about drought, and we also introduce more drought, that's going to have a pretty big impact. Um, I don't know if it will lead to any sort of mortality or death. I certainly hope not. Uh, I guess it could. That's an open, end, an unanswered question currently. Uh, but it will at least have a big impact on growth and 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 what what services forests provide in terms of of being able to 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 use you know take CO two out of the atmosphere. Thanks. Well, now I have two questions related to uh, fires. One is if you could please talk more about the effects on fire in forest. And if given the large number of forest fires, are trees really a good thing for carbon in the future? Those are, those are, those are good, excellent questions. So fire is an interesting component. Uh, fire used to be more prevalent in the landscape in the Eastern United States. Um, Native Americans uh, use it a lot for their, for their management uh, practices mostly to promote oaks and hickories, actually, because they produce acorns, which attract, you know, feral hogs, or in this case it was wild hogs and deer, and they could hunt even bison and elk at that point in time. Um, so fires aren't terribly common here, but they do happen. Think of Gatlinburg in 2016. I don't, I don't know if you remember that or not, but I mean, it's a very touristy town and hotels burnt down. I mean, like this is, so this is in Tennessee and North Carolina, a very wet area. So this can certainly happen even in the Eastern U.S., and the Western U.S. has been kind of interesting. We have giant fires. Um, and that's a, it's a compounded by two different things. One, fire suppression. You know, Smokey the Bear is great. Put out your forest fires. But we've been doing that for so long and not allowing anything to burn that when something does catch on fire, there's a lot of fuel on the, on the ground. I mean, a ton. And so a low intensity fire that just kind of burns through, maybe it scorches the bark, does a little bit of damage to a tree. Trees can live through that. We have trees they've evolved to live in fire. They really can't even reproduce without fire. Their seeds won't come out of their cones unless there is fire. And so fire is a, is a natural part of the landscape and trees have adapted to it. But fires that are burning taller than the trees and creating these sort of fire tornadoes, which is a real thing actually, um, no forest can withstand that. And so in that regard, if we're gonna have fires that burn down huge, huge amounts of forest, um, and maybe these are really old forests. Maybe these forests have been around for a thousand years and all of them go up. But yeah, I mean, all that carbon is gone. It's out back out in the atmosphere. Um, and so, you know, these that carbon pool was for a thousand years and now it's been released uh, in a fire. And so, um, yeah, fire fire is an important part of the landscape. Um, it's an important part of the system. And we're still understanding what all that means in terms of our carbon cycling and budget. I see. <laughs> Um, I have another question related to a tornado. So after a tornado to cover the path of trees, uh, should people let it go and come back naturally or clean up the trees that were blown over? That's an interesting question. So, you know, we had that tornado that hit McCormick's Creek Park recently. Um, that was really scary. So I guess, it, I guess I'd say it depends. It depends on the situation and how big the tornado was and what the landscape was in which um it calls you know it blew trees down so let's just say it's more of an urban landscape yeah you should replant those because like those are more for like our enjoyment as humans i don't you shouldn't feel any guilt about replacing you know replanting a yard or a park tree in a forest it can be kind of interesting if it's a pretty narrow path 
I think just leaving it, if it's not in the way of anything, is fine. Forests are meant, they can recover from this. Um, blow downs are natural. Um, this, actually, when I go into a forest and I want to see if it's old, I'm going to be looking for trees on the ground. It's one of the big indicators of an older forest. If there's no trees on the ground, everything's kind of the same size and they're all, and, and there's no trees on the ground, it's a good indication it's not, not a very old forest. Um, so you can leave it there. Um, if it's a huge swath of land, or maybe it's like impacting a trail or an access to a park, um, or maybe it has a profound impact on the way people think about a park or something like that, I think it's fine to replant, go ahead and, and clean up and replant, and help it up. I do think you have to be careful what species you choose to replant. Um, in the early 1930s, the US Forest Service planted a lot of red pine. Uh, you can still see remnants of this, and it was actually in tornado tracks. So like Pioneer Mothers has this really weird linear path of red pine that the US Forest Service planted after a tornado. Um, and it's just weird. And it's getting outcompeted now with from the hardwoods uh, over almost 100 years later. Um, and so they're all, they're all dying. But, it, you know, so I, I would encourage you to plant the trees that would have established naturally. You can speed up the process. That's fine. Uh, and then maybe not clear everything up. All that, all those trees that fall down are really great biomass. It can really be, uh, there's something called a tree nursery where sometimes a lot of new trees will come up along the log of a fallen tree over time. Um, and so maybe maybe somewhere in the middle would be my, my I mean, I guess it just depends. Uh, I'm all, humans are part of the landscape. So I'm not the type that says we shouldn't be managing our forest or anything. Um, I think I think we have an important role. Um, but yeah, that's my rough advice. Cool. Uh, we have another question related to the age of the trees. How old do Eastern red cedars get? Oh man, they can get really old actually. Um, there's, a, there's a cool website. Uh, if you Google... I think if you Google either, either if you Google old list or Eastern old list, uh, it's actually got a whole list of tree species and the oldest known individuals that people like me have found. Not everybody reports to the website. I don't, I mean, I haven't done it in a while because like the shagbark hickory I found in Shelbyville is not on there, uh, but people have reported it. I'm trying to remember, it's really close to a thousand years old. I, I want to say it's like 850 or 880, something like that. But yeah, maybe in your spare time, take a take a gander at the Eastern Old List. Or if you can't, that one that one might not work anymore. If it doesn't, then type in like the Old List, oldest known trees, and then you can go through, find the species you want, and it'll tell you how old it is. But it's it's really close to a thousand, but not quite. Wow. Not bad. Yeah. We have a person a person in the chat really interested in walnuts, and have you ever worked with black walnuts? I have actually, uh, according to my Pioneer Mothers, um, that's the only site, I think that's the only site I've actually worked with them, and they went back to the late 1700s <clears throat> at, at Pioneer Mothers. Um, they're hard to find, really old black ones are hard to find, and the reason why is because their wood is so awesome. It's really valuable, it's beautiful, right? Like, uh, I actually have a mantle on my fireplace made out of a black walnut that was in my father-in-law's yard. Um, so... You know, they're not they're just hard. It's just so valuable. I mean, think about if you had a nice straight black walnut, you can, to this day and age, you can still get like 20K for that thing. And so like, it's really hard to to think about. So there's not a ton of them out there, but Pioneer Mothers have some. I'm sure there's a few other places. Um, but yeah, they, they exist. Um, you know, they're just not quite as common in terms of how old they are because they're very valuable. Um, what would you say is the most challenging tree species to cross date? Um, that's easy. It's called a genus called Nisa. Um, so it's also known as Tupelo. And so they're in there. They're, if you're ever walking around the fall, um, there's sassafras, which is a really beautiful tree in the fall. It's like it turns pretty bright red, but there's another one is Tupelo. And this is Nisa sabbatica is the scientific name. As or call, also known as a black gum is the common name. And it is so diffuse porous that you cannot really see the ring boundaries. Like they appear really distinct for a bit and they kind of fade away. That they're so problematic, uh, but I'm almost certain they're the oldest angiosperm in North America. So I'm writing this National Geographic grant to try to find it. Uh, and it's just kind of like, it's just fun. Uh, but they're absolute pain and they take so much time. So I'm actually building this whole like camera system where we can take really high resolution images of, of the samples and I can look at them on the screen because now we scan them. We scan them with like a normal scanner and we have these programs that allow you to put, put the rings in so I can see, you know, what I did and adjust them really easily. 
but the scanner resolution is so terrible. You can't see it. It's just pixelated when you zoom in to that level. So I'm going to get a high-end camera and then stitch those photographs together uh, to try to use them. So that, that would, I mean, I'm literally buying specialized equipment for this species. So for me, that's the hardest species I've worked with. I have worked in Bangladesh in the mangrove forest as well. And I would say that every single tropical species I've ever worked on in Vietnam, Bangladesh, and, and uh, parts of Brazil are absolutely horrible. They're so hard because they actually don't grow. They, they, they Sometimes they'll stop growing and produce a ring. And other times they just keep growing. I don't know what to do with that. And so that's problematic. But in terms of trees that I know go dormant, Tupelo or black gum is by far the hardest for me. Oh, I didn't expect that answer, but good to know. <laughs> <laughs> um, can cosmic radiation impact and changes in Earth magnetic field be accurately tracked by tree rings? And does this correlate with climate change in any way? Sorry, I, I didn't catch the first part of the question. And can cosmic radiation impact uh, and changes in Earth magnetic field be tracked by tree rings? It's a good question. I honestly don't know 100%. There are a lot of people doing some really cool chemical analysis of the wood, uh, particularly like at uh, pollution sites. Mm -hmm. uh, but in terms of the electromagnetic field, I don't know of anything. Uh, I, I, I'm the type of person, though, that would never would say, like, that's not possible because, like, I, I, I'm humble enough to know that we, do, we don't know a lot. You know, we don't know everything. Um, but to, to I don't know of any way of doing that currently. Uh, but there are some dendrochemists out there that are doing some really cool work, mostly with volcanoes, though. It's like looking at all the, all the stuff they spew. You can actually record that in the ring that records those chemicals or uh, on pollutants. Um, that's a good question. I don't have a very good answer for it, unfortunately. Um, what do you see happening regarding large national forests in various areas of the country? Will they thin out, possibly disappear? So, I mean, in the vast majority of the country now, I think national forests will, are fine. Uh, you know, there might be some damages, um, but they're probably fine. The exception to those are in the southwestern United States, particularly those that are in high altitude locations they're getting clobbered by hotter temperatures, uh, giant fires, huge insect outbreaks, some that are native insects that's just warmer so they can reproduce more. Um, I'm actually very concerned about forests in this in this ecosystem. I don't I don't know what the future of those forests are. Um, it doesn't it's bleak, it's bleak. I mean, but but you know trees are trees are resilient and that is not to say there won't be a forest there. There just may not be super old forest there. I, I don't know. It might be shifting. Maybe other species fill into this area because it's gotten warmer. Um, but that's where we're seeing the most change. So I'm thinking of places like, you know, Flagstaff, Arizona, uh, parts of Colorado, uh, parts of Utah, northern New Mexico, like that that sort of region to me. It, and there's a lot of national forests in, in, in that region. And so those, those forests could change dramatically. I think they'll still be forest. They're just not going to be the forest that we know of right now. But the rest of the country, I think the national forests are fine. I don't think they'll, I mean, there might be some fire here, mortality there. I think, but I think overall, they'll probably not change all that much. Um, could you tell us something about your ongoing projects in Indiana forests? Yeah, so my ongoing project is, uh, it's a little bit technical, but, you know, when we think about how vulnerable our forests are to climate, Everything I presented today in that dendroecology part of the talk uh, was about canopy dominant trees. So all these trees that are the tallest trees in, in the forest. But there's a bunch of stuff that's underneath that, right? Um, and those also play an important role. We have no idea how what they do. We don't know how they respond to drought. We don't know how that changes. It seems like such a basic thing. Like, how do you not know what an understory tree is doing compared to a canopy dominant tree? Um, there's a few schools of thought. One is that these big trees in the forest will shade the trees below hand and protect them. And so they're probably going to be less sensitive to drought because they, you know, it's not going to be as hot. Um, they also have much shallower roots. So if it is dry, maybe they can't access water. So maybe they're more sensitive to drought than our canopy dominant trees. So I basically have an estimation. Here's what forests are, here's, here's how forests will, will, will respond to drought, but I'm missing a very important part of the forest. And so that's what my current work in Indiana is trying to 
estimate how much does that change throughout, you know, so we can actually get a proper forest estimate of response. Okay, well, thanks a lot, yes, Jill. And that was the last question. We made it to the end of the of the session. So again, I'd like to thank people in the audience for their attention and for submitting all your questions. Um, if you feel curious or you want to know more about tree rings, uh, we can recommend you some readings. Uh, the first book uh, would be, thanks Vanessa for sharing the slides, slides. Uh, it would be a tree ring story, the history of the world, written in print by Valerie Dredd. Um, this book not only provides a deep insight into different endocrinology applications, it's also full of anecdotes and reflections about the scientific career. And if you ever thought that a scientific career was boring and free of danger, this book may change your mind. <laughs> the second book, uh, Tree Rings and Climate, I agree it's, it's more technical, but I would say it's the first manual about the endocrinology that you should read if you want to work with tree rings. It's beautifully written and full of pictures to illustrate three growth pa patterns. And it would be like the, your first friend when you want to dip into the tree rings. And finally, Tree Rings and Telescopes, a scientific career, or Andrew Elico Douglas. It tells the story of Andrew Douglas, the father of the endocrinology. Um, he was an astronomer that lost his job. And then he began working at a university and began to look at tree rings to reconstruct solar storms. So it's a little bit dense, I won't lie, that it's a book about science, but it's also the story of resilience, new beginnings, and it tells the story of how this beautiful discipline was born. Great, thanks again for joining us and participating in this evening's live stream. I would like to personally thank Professor Maxwell and Dr. Furry for their time and expertise. We are grateful to you all. I would like to acknowledge the IU Alumni Association and its members for assisting with tonight's program. Finally, I should acknowledge that events like this would not be possible without the support of donors who understand the value of a liberal arts education. If you would like to support programs like tonight's presentation or other opportunities that connect alumni and friends with the College of Arts and Sciences, please consider making a contribution to the IU Bloomington College Alumni Engagement Fund at the IU Foundation. Until next time, please take care and best wishes for a happy and healthy holiday season. Thank you.